Mad Honey and Novel is a story of two high school students, Lily and Asher, who fall in love in small town New Hampshire. Asher Fields is known as the all-American athletic son raised by a single beekeeping mother, Olivia, who left an abusive marriage to return to the home she grew up in for a fresh start at life with her son. Lily Campanello was born a boy and lives as a transgender young woman, the gender she's identified with since she was a child, who moves with her mother, Ava, to start her life over as a young woman in New Hampshire. Mad Honey is a heavy hitting story about gender identity, sexuality, violence, and potentially murder. It's also the story of love, of love lost, and of individuals who are faced with decisions to live the life of their dreams or to live a life dictated by others. The story is beautifully co-told in the voice of Lily and of Olivia, both pinnacle women in Asher's life who have long held secrets that have brought them pain, shame, the threat and reality of violence, and a fear of judgment and unacceptance by others. Through their words, we get to walk in their footsteps, experiencing life as they do, both women whose lives intertwine because of a shared love of the same boy and a yearning to life to start life over again. We've assembled a panel of individuals who have read Mad Honey to highlight some of the key aspects of the story that resonate with us as gender and communication students. On the panel today is Hannah, Bl Hannah Blunden, Ella Burns, Charles Byrne, and Jane Wilson. There is a significant number of key points that are worthy of discussion here, but as a group, we've decided to highlight a few aspects that resonated with us um, and bring those forward for discussion. Our hope is that this conversation inspires similar lines of thought and inquiry for each of you. So Jane, I, I wanna jump in there because I think that, you know, the biggest achievement of Mad Honey is that it really reaches a bit of a broader audience. So for those who aren't familiar with the story, it is advertised as being sort of this, you know, who done it mystery. Uh, and really it's, you know, it ends up being a story about much, much more. Uh, there's a lot of issues broached in it, you know, toxic masculinity. Uh, there's many gender issues, but the core of the story is about Lily as a transgender youth struggling to find, uh, find themselves. And, you know, the real story here is sort of cloaked, like I said, in a whodunit mystery. And that's why I chose to read it. But looking at all the books that we could read for this course, um, I decided that I would pick this up because I really like mystery novels. And, you know, you read it and it's about, you have this boy who's accused of murder and then his mother who has to question him and, and whether or not, you know, did he do this? Uh, is this something that he could have done? And so it sounded like a book that I would be interested in and something that I could read quite quickly because that's, you know, that that is what I enjoy. Um, and there's a whole group of people like me probably that would want to read it and, and you know, pretend to be Sherlock Holmes and try and crack that case. But you end up learning so much more about gender identity. Um, and I think as the discussion around 2S LGBTQIA plus rights becomes more dominant in the public square with a specific focus on trans rights, it's important that people have a certain level of knowledge about the subject. And it's important that our mainstream stories or stories that are in the media uh, are, you know, in our literature, take on these issues. And right now we have a void, I think, that's being filled in the public square by some of the loudest voices. And sometimes they're often very negative. If you look at the discussion that's happening in New Brunswick around safe schools, um, you know, it, it's it's all a very sensitive subject. And some people might be uncomfortable trying to learn more about this. But what Mad Honey, Mad Honey does is it provides an accessible story that gives a demographic that was probably not reachable before, you know, that mystery novel reader, an entry point into learning about trans issues because they pick it up thinking it's it's one thing. And then halfway through, you know, they learn the truth about Lily. And it's really this this beautiful, harrowing tale that's going to reach a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't be reached. And they're going to learn a lot about trans issues. They're going to become more empathetic for those people. And when you read that story, really, people should be rooting for Lily and wanting her, you know, the best for her and, and her to live her life as she wants to uh, wants to wants to live it. That's really interesting, Charlie. I I'm not a whodunit kind of reader. I don't usually grab books for that that um, reason. But you raise some good points. So is it possible that it could be perceived another way? I mean, we know transgender individuals often have to hide who they are. Um, and it's hard for them to come out. So having it cloaked in in a novel, in a mystery novel like this, could it be perceived another way, do you think? 
Yeah, I think, you know, from my perspective, I, I certainly think it's a good thing, but I'm sure that, you know, I don't have that lived experience uh, as a as a transgender person. Um, I'm not part of that community, so perhaps they would perceive in a different way. I, I imagine it must be very difficult um, for them to be who they are in a lot of cases, and perhaps they would look at this book uh, as, you know, kind of veiling the true meaning, and, and that's not really being true to to the trans cause. I, I don't want to speak for them, but I think it's entirely possible that they might feel that way. Um, and I think that would be entirely valid. From my perspective, I, I think it's probably a good thing, but, you know, it definitely could be uh, perceived that way. And, and I think, you know, it'll be interesting, Jane, you raised that point, like, it'll be interesting to see where this is in 20 years, you know, will we look back on this and say, you know, they kind of um, washed over it a little bit, it, it wasn't the right thing to do. Or will people see it as being, you know, a, a good thing? But yeah, it's an interesting question. I think it could go, you know, either way, depending on, depending on your your background and and your gender identity, maybe. Yeah, I have a point that I wanted to bring up. Um, I think having uh, bringing up that Lily's transgender only halfway through the book might upset some people, and not um, having the book not be like being cloaked in a mystery novel. I don't. Do you think like people would be able to see this as a hidden agenda from the <laughs> community? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, again, like I think this is a very good thing. I think it's a very positive way to approach this issue. It's very accessible. It provides people that probably wouldn't, you know, pick up a story that's advertised on the front about being a transgender you trying to find themselves. But um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a possibility that people that aren't comfortable with the subject matter might feel that it's it's a bit of a a hidden agenda that's kind of being pushed on them. Uh, because that is sort of, you know, one of those talking points that anti-transgender individuals often say is that there is a secret agenda. So it, definitely something that could be perceived that way. But mm -hmm. I think on a whole, it, it, it's probably a, a good thing. Yeah, I think Lily's character is so unique that they do wait to introduce that she's transgender until the middle of the novel, because readers really have this opportunity to get to know Lily and feel for her character before finding this out. And I think it really allows people to confront their biases and take a minute to think, hey, I liked this character before, but how does knowing this about her change my reaction or change my thoughts or feelings about this? And I think we see Olivia struggle with this also in the novel as Olivia only finds out Lily is transgender at the trial and she's kind of blindsided by the news um, of knowing this. So I think having her struggle with it lets us kind of see how other people struggle with uh, this fact that she had kept a secret. Um, Ella, do you think that having these issues come up in a novel by a very popular author, and um, do you think it's the best place for people to confront their own biases? Do you think people will feel comfortable with that? Yeah, I know like a lot of books like Jodi Picoult's novels um, are used for things like book clubs. <laughs> I think she's a really popular book club author. Um, so I think the novel is actually a great way to communicate the topic effectively because it allows people to talk and discuss and think about their own stereotypes and biases in this like safe sort of environment um, rather than dealing with it maybe with like a TV show or music, something by themselves. They have this group of people that allows and even us to chat about this topic in an environment that's safe. Do you think that's what it does, Ella? Like, do you think it encourages, I guess, readers to, you know, address their biases along with Olivia as she, do as she does? Like, is that is that sort of the point that you're meant to reflect on your own views, do you think? I think so. I think having Olivia's dialogue in there and having Olivia struggle with the issue of finding out this secret provides the opportunity to a reader to learn and to think about these same things. Maybe they wouldn't be encouraged to think about their own biases if Lily or if Olivia doesn't um, think about them. And you can agree or disagree with her ways of thinking, but I think it definitely triggers that thought process. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of characters in this novel, like Lily, that struggle to open up and reveal things about themselves that they don't necessarily want others to know. Yeah, I think, um, Ella, that really resonated for me when I was reading the story and, and learning about the characters. and. 
Um, I mean, it's told by two women, as we know, that both are in love with Asher. But I was really struck by both of these main characters, not just the two main characters, but struck by the ones who were telling the story, that they were keeping very significant parts of their lives to themselves. Um, and while the reasons for hiding or keeping parts of themselves to themselves were different, um, it, it's you know, I, I find they were hiding parts of themselves. Olivia was a doctor's wife who looked from the outside like she was living a dream life. But she we know that she suffered um, domestic abuse at the hand of her husband, somebody that she loved, and she hid that. Um, Lily, as we know, was was uh, born as Liam, as Liam uh, not living the life that they wanted to to live. And as Lily also had something that she was holding back as well. They both felt shame and pain and were tormented by not being able to live their lives and, and be their authentic and free selves that they wanted to be. So for me, in, in looking at some of the things that we've learned in class and looking at the concepts of this story, I was really struck by how heavy a burden society and our ideals can place on individuals and how powerful it is that that yearning and that need and that desire to be accepted and loved and to belong. Um, so I think that really stood out for me in the novel as well. I know that in the book, um, it challenged the concept of what a secret is and the difference between what is secret and what is private specifically. Um, so do you think this might have been strategic by the authors? Did you, you know, question what you think is a secret and what is considered private? I, I kind of hope that was strategic. I'd like to think that it was strategic on their part because like um, Ella was saying, I think we're left kind of wondering how we would respond in those situations. And so it made me wonder, um, you know, Lily didn't tell people that she was transgender. Asher didn't tell people that he was in love with somebody who was a transgender woman. But then it made me ask myself, did they need to? Was it a secret? Yeah. Um, does it make it would make no difference other than mm -hmm. to Lily and Asher that they were in love? So why did why did I even feel like, oh, they're holding these secrets? Um, I think it was likely an important part of the book, as we know, I, uh, we talked about Jody Picot and then Jennifer Boylan, uh, Jennifer Finley, Finney Boylan, a transgender woman. I think it was probably intentional. And I, I felt myself changing as I read the, the book and learned more about the characters. And the yeah, truth is, um, we all sort of, sorry, we all make decisions on a regular basis about how we want to present ourselves to others. And so I think that's something that was a common theme in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess continuing with that, there is one thing in the book that I couldn't find anyone else who related to it online, but the idea of like what is strategic by the authors and what is being presented um, so we know that Olivia was in an abusive relationship with Asher's father, Brendan, and throughout the book, she describes how calculated his moves were, like any kind gesture had a malicious intent behind it. Um, and he knew how to make her feel like a queen, but also a servant at the same time. So we see Mike, who is the, the town detective. Um, he's a previous love interest of Olivia's that they dated in high school. And he's also the one who arrested Asher and testifies against him during the trial. And, you know, that's, you know, whatever it is. But then it comes out where he's hanging around the trial. He seems to be pursuing Olivia as a love interest. He's trying to be supportive with her. And that transition didn't completely make sense to me. I thought it was a bit odd that he went from you know, being the one who arrested her son and charging him with murder to trying to be supportive of Olivia. Like, it, it didn't really make sense to me. And I thought that the timing was kind of inappropriate and might have mirrored um, those actions of Braden's, the very, yeah. um, like, intentional... Wooing. Very almost. thought out. Yeah. yeah, like, everything had a, a motive behind it. Um, and then, you know, how he shows up at the end and he's like, oh, you know, like, I'm here, I want to be with you. And it's like six in the morning and he scares the crap out of her. And I'm unsure of whether this pairing um, was an intentional example of someone relapsing into a toxic relationship or if it was, um, you know, what, what do you guys think? Like, 
did yeah. you pick up on any of these details or was it just me? I think there's definitely a power differential between them, right? As you say, um, you know, he is a police officer. He's investigating her son. He definitely has this sort of authority over Olivia. And it's it, it's just a very odd relationship. And there's definitely parallels between that relationship and her relationship with, um, you know, Asher's father. I think it was probably maybe a convenient choice uh, for the authors to make, perhaps, to to tie it up. I, I, I don't know. But yeah, it struck me as very strange as well, Hannah, I have to say. Mm -hmm. So do you think it could have been the start of another toxic relationship? Like if there was a, a sequel, do you think it would start off with a, a toxic relationship? Yeah, I mean, potentially, uh, you know, it was it's it's a it's a tough one. It's uh, it's I think a bit of a convenient choice by the authors, perhaps to to write that in there. And and I think that's probably one of the downsides of, of Mad Huddy is that there's just so much crammed into this novel uh, mm -hmm. that not all the themes are, are fully explored. But certainly, you know, issues around um, trans rights and, and, and I think just the process um, that those people go through and just eliciting empathy from its reader for those people. I, I think that's its biggest achievement. But to your point, there are definitely some downfalls as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, I think we could dive into this topic so much further because there's so many subtopics um, within the novel. But we are getting to the end of our 15 minutes. Um, so, yeah, Mad Honey really resonated, I think, with all of us and all of us were allowed to feel different things and pick out different topics out of the novel and through the characters, we can almost feel um, what it's like to be in their shoes and we're invested in them. And I think it allows us um, to think outside of ourselves and expand our knowledge in a way to allow us to confront our biases and values. Um, and I think Mad Honey isn't necessarily a novel that readers of Jodi Picoult would uh, think of uh, just because of what she's written in the past. Gender issues aren't normally brought up in a typical mystery novel, but I think in doing so, the authors, both uh, Jodi and Jennifer, find a really gentle way of expanding our horizons and make the readers have positive change um, in their lives. So we thank you for joining us and hope you enjoyed our discussion. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.